Britain is about to be flattened by a tidal wave of debt. It doesn't matter if you vote Conservative, Liberal, Labour, UKIP, or for no party at all. The facts are the facts. Let's take a look at some numbers. Two and a half years ago, when the coalition government formed, we were already in a huge amount of debt. In fact, the previous government had left the country sinking under £700 billion worth. The coalition has spent the last two and a half years desperately and very publicly trying to get our finances in order. We've had an austerity budget. We've had tax hikes. We've had the cuts. But for all that, our national debt is still growing at an incredible rate. Despite David Cameron's talk of austerity, he's going to add an estimated £700 billion to the national debt in just five years. That's more than Tony Blair and Gordon Brown added to the national debt in 11 years. It's more than every British government of the past 100 years put together. The fact is, when you look at our finances as a whole, the coalition isn't cutting anything. State spending is going up, our national debt is going up, and our interest payments are going up. By the next general election in 2015, our national debt is estimated to stand at almost £1.4 trillion. It's clear our public finances are in an enormous mess. Anyone can see that. And to some extent, some politicians will admit it. But add in our financial, personal and private debts, and an even darker picture emerges. Compared to the size of our economy, Britain is now one of the most heavily indebted countries in the Western world. That's official. Our total debts stand at more than five times what our entire economy is worth. Proportionately, that's more debt than Italy, Portugal, Spain, and almost twice as much debt as Greece. Those are four countries already in the throes of financial crisis. We're the odd one out because we haven't collapsed. Yet. But things can't stay that way for long. You see, the only countries that have more debt than us are Japan, where the economy has stagnated for 20 years and the stock market has crashed by 75%. And Ireland, where the housing market has crashed 50% and the government has been forced to accept a bailout. In fact, our debts tower above almost every other nation's. Here are the figures that prove it. That's absolutely incredible, isn't it? Yet you've probably never seen this fact reported in the Telegraph or on Sky News. And the worst part is, even that isn't the full story. Because when you add in all of Britain's unfunded obligations, promises the government has made on things like public sector pensions, our debts swell to 900% of our economy. That's right. When you add everything up, we owe nine times what our entire economy is worth. Our political leaders still like to see Britain as a world power. But let's not delude ourselves. It's clear to see we're totally broke. It doesn't matter which set of figures you use or which way you look at Britain's debts. We're merely talking about different shades of disaster here. A country can either pay back its debts or it can't, and it's very clear to us that Britain can't. But how did we get here? After all, we were once the richest and most powerful nation on earth. What happened to all of our money? On the 1st of January 1909, something happened for the first time in British history. The government agreed to redistribute taxes to support people in their old age. On that day, more than any other, the modern welfare state began in earnest. The rules were simple. Men aged 70 and above could claim between two and five shillings per week from the government. But for all the positive press and good feeling, the government wasn't really making that big a financial commitment, because back then the average working man could only expect to live to 48 years of age. That's the equivalent of offering someone a pension today, but only when they reach the ripe old age of 115. So the idea of rewarding anyone who made it to 70 with a handout from the public purse seemed perfectly fair, and more importantly for the government, cheap. 
it was a perfectly workable policy, but few politicians realised that they were setting in motion a sequence of events that would inevitably lead to the crisis Britain faces now. And let's not forget, at the beginning of the 20th century, Britain still had a booming overseas empire. It had yet to fight in the cripplingly expensive First World War. The economy was on a seemingly permanent upward trajectory. And the idea that Britain could face any kind of decline, financial or otherwise, had not yet entered mainstream thinking. We could afford to pay for a welfare state, so why shouldn't we implement it? But there was one problem. Now the welfare state had started, no one had any idea where it would stop, or whether it could actually be stopped if it became unaffordable. We'd created a trap for ourselves, then stepped right into it. It wasn't until the Second World War was finally over that the welfare state really began to grow. Welfare was seen as a major part of winning the peace, keeping the forces of socialism and fascism at bay. Of course, politicians soon realised welfare wasn't just a tool to win the peace. It was also incredibly effective at winning votes, too. This same scenario came to be repeated across the world, in the USA, Japan and across Europe. Seemingly limitless economic growth and prosperity allowed politicians to make an essentially unlimited promise. The government promised to look after you from cradle to grave. This single powerful idea gave government the license to swell to a size unimaginable just half a century earlier. The promises got bigger and so did the cost. In just a few short years, the size of the welfare state grew almost uncontrollably in a flurry of new laws. There was the Butler Act which reformed schooling, the Family Allowance Act, the National Insurance Act, the National Health Act, the list went on. The problem was, this all came with a nasty side effect. It was immensely expensive. Everyone assumed we'd be able to pay for it forever, but they were wrong. Politicians found themselves totally and utterly caught in this trap. Any attempt to reduce the size of the welfare state was met with often violent resistance in the form of strikes and protests. Or the party trying to cut back, to do the sensible thing, was simply voted out of power. After all, an ever-growing proportion of the population now benefited from the welfare state in one way or another. The safety net couldn't just be pulled away. The government would forever be saddled with an expense that could only grow. And grow it did. Since public pensions were first introduced, average life expectancy has grown from 48 to 80, a 67% increase. But the age at which we retire has remained essentially the same. This has resulted in an estimated £5 trillion worth of pension promises the state has made to its citizens, roughly five times what our entire economy is worth. No one has any idea how we'll pay these. The recent attempts by the government to change the retirement age don't go anywhere near solving the problem. As people have lived longer, the strain on the NHS the demand for medication, more doctors, nurses and other staff, as well as a skyrocketing cost of caring for the elderly, has pushed our finances to breaking point. In fact, as state spending has grown, so has the cost of running the welfare system itself. For instance, the state employs half a million civil servants. To put that into perspective, during the height of the British Empire, when Britain ran a quarter of the planet, the state employed just 4,000 civil servants. If you're in any doubt just how out of control state spending has become, simply take a look at this. As you can see, spending has exploded in a way no one could have imagined a hundred years ago. With the idea of welfare being such a vote winner, no government could take the bull by the horns and cut it back, not in any meaningful way. They could fiddle round the edges and save a few pennies here and there, but as population grew larger and lived longer, all they could really do was sit back and let a future generation sort it out. And now, it's come down to us. In 2012, for example, the government spent 
roughly £120 billion more than it collects in taxes. In a situation like this, when you spend more than you earn, there's only one way of paying for it, by borrowing money. That alone is bad enough, but remember, we also have to service our debts, to pay interest on a pile of debt that's mounting ever higher, debt that we'll never pay back. So a vicious cycle was set in motion. Politicians realised that to remain in office, they needed to make bigger promises, call for bigger reforms and ultimately borrow more and more money. This addiction to debt has spread into every corner of British society. Banks, businesses, the ordinary man on the street. These days they all carry a great weight of debt. Debt has become normal. Want a holiday? Pay for it on credit. Want a new crowd-pleasing cut in taxes? Fund it with debt. To put it bluntly, our politicians, so-called educated people who were meant to be looking after our interests, acted like teenagers with their first credit card, all to win votes. If the UK had been a business or an individual, we'd have been declared bankrupt by now. We'd have been forced to sell our business premises or our home and would have been housed in a run-down flat long ago. We are broke. We have been for a long time. But very soon, it will really hit home. So what's different about today? Why can't the government just keep giving us more and take on more debt to pay for it? That's worked for a hundred years. Why won't it work now? The answer to that is simple. The explosion of government spending and government debt has mostly come in the past 30 years, and during that time it's been easy and cheap for the government to borrow money. You see, interest rates on the government's debt have been steadily falling for 30 years. Here, let us show you. In 1982, Margaret Thatcher's government had to pay 15% to borrow money for three years. This came in the form of a bond, a gilt. Anyone with money, be it a rich country or a pension fund, could invest in the bonds and receive 15% interest in return. But over time, the government's borrowing costs have fallen, dramatically. Now, the government only has to pay 2% to borrow money over the same period. That's seven times cheaper than in 1982. And low interest rates make it easier to borrow money. Debt has been getting steadily cheaper for three decades. That has allowed the government to borrow more and more money without having to face the consequences. But these good times are about to come to an end. The simple truth is, if interest rates were at their normal rate of 5%, instead of around the extremely low 2% they're at right now, there's absolutely no way Britain could ever repay its debts. In fact, at normal rates of interest, we're already bust, not just in over our heads, but six feet under. It's simple maths. If interest rates moved back towards the normal 5% level, our cost of borrowing would triple. Just to put that into context, if our current debt repayments tripled, the government would have to take drastic action, like abolishing the state pension or privatising the NHS, or pushing tax rates back up to 90% as they were in the 1960s. In short, Britain would change radically. And that's just if interest rates move back to normal levels. The fact is, when you're in a lot of debt, interest rates are either your lifeline or your death sentence. So long as rates stay low, you can just about keep things on track. You can service your debts, keep borrowing and keep the walls from your door. When rates move higher, you get squeezed and eventually you're finished. All of a sudden, you have to find more and more money to cover the interest on your debt. This is an extreme example of what happens when interest rates take off. As you can see, in 2009, the Greek government could borrow money at just 1%. Then, in the wake of the financial crisis, the Greek economy hit the rocks, fell into recession, and the markets realised what a complete mess the country was in. Interest rates shot up 
vertically and Greece imploded, not just financially, but socially and politically too. As you've seen on the news, there have been riots, suicides, overnight poverty, snap elections and crushing general strikes. People couldn't get their money out of banks fast enough. Businesses collapsed. In that environment, just keeping your family safe is a big challenge. That's the danger of rocketing interest rates to a country with huge debts. As Douglas Carswell MP said recently, Greece might be the first Western country to discover that you cannot keep running up debts to pay for a lifestyle you did not earn. She will not be the last. The laws of mathematics are universal. In Britain, interest rates on government borrowing now stand at record lows. If we're not at rock bottom, then we're incredibly close. That means the most important trend of the next 20 years is almost certainly rising interest rates. Debt has been getting cheaper for 30 years. Now it's about to start getting much more expensive. We're now facing an unprecedented crisis. As interest rates rise, our record debts will become impossible to bear. No one can say how quickly things will escalate. Interest rates could rise overnight, or they could slowly and inevitably push higher, taking years to slowly strangle the economy, the housing market, the stock market, stripping us all of our wealth one day at a time. What we can say with certainty is that sooner or later, interest rates will rise. We're approaching the day when foreign investors realise the scale of our problems and demand higher interest rates or stop lending to us altogether. When that day arrives, we are certain things will get nasty.